Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from AntiWar.com. This is Anti-War News for Monday, September 9th, 2024. All right, the first story at the top of antiwar.com today, family of an American killed by Israel seeks an investigation. So on Friday, an American was killed by the Israeli military in the occupied West Bank. And the family of this American is calling for President Biden to order an investigation into the shooting instead of relying on Israel to investigate itself. So Aishanor Izi Agi was 26 years old. She was killed while protesting illegal Israeli settlements in the West Bank village of Beta. And this demonstration she was involved with was organized by the International Solidarity Mo- Movement, and she was involved with that organization. And an autopsy report confirmed that she was killed by an Israeli sniper bullet that hit her head, so she was shot in the head. Uh, Aigi was taken to a hospital in the nearby city of Nablus, where she was pronounced dead. So Aigi's family said in a statement, quote, A U.S. citizen, Aishinor, was peacefully standing for justice when she was killed by a bullet that video shows came from an Israeli military shooter, end quote. The White House said that it was deeply disturbed by Aigi's killing, but did not blame the shooting on Israeli forces and said that it asked the Israeli government to investigate the incident. You see this picture here. These are Palestinians in Nablus um, marching to honor um, this American woman who was killed. Uh, So Aigi's family said, quote, we welcome the White House's statement of condolences, but given the circumstances of Aishinor's killing, an Israeli investigation is not adequate. We call on President Biden, Vice President Harris, and Secretary of State Blinken to order an independent investigation into the unlawful killing of a U.S. citizen and to ensure full accountability for the guilty parties, end quote. They put this this statement out on Saturday, which was the day after she was killed. So the Israeli military admitted that it fired at the demonstrators, claiming that it, quote, responded with fire toward a main instigator of violent activity who hurled rocks at the forces and posed a threat to them, end quote. But eyewitnesses say that Agi and the other demonstrators posed no threat to Israeli troops. Another uh, American activist who was involved uh, went by the name Vivi, um, told Haaretz, quote, It was a direct shot to the head. It was not an accident. She was being extra safe out of all the volunteers. She and her friends were standing the furthest back in the safest spot that we thought, end quote. So Aigi was born in Turkey and moved to the U.S. with her family before she turned one. So she lived in the U.S., you know, her whole life. She recently graduated from the University of Washington, where she studied psychology and psychology and Middle Eastern languages and cultures. Her family said, quote, she was active on campus in student led protests, advocating for human dignity and calling for an end to the violence against the people of Palestine. Aishinor felt compelled to travel to the West Bank to stand in solidarity with Palestinian civilians who continue to endure ongoing repressing and violence, end quote. So Aigi was also a Turkish citizen, and the Turkish government released a statement calling her killing a murder that was carried out by the Israeli government. So obviously a much stronger statement than what the U.S. put out. Um, So Erdogan, the Turkish president, he said on Saturday, quote, Yesterday, Israel heinously murdered our young child, Aishinor Ezgi Egi. To date, they have killed over 40,000 innocent civilians, including 17,000 children. They attack barbarically and shed blood indiscriminately, whether it be children, women, youth, or the elderly, end quote. So Americans, uh, this is the third American to be killed in the West Bank this year. Earlier this year, two 17-year-old Palestinian American boys Mohammed Kudor and Tafik Abdel Jabbar were shot and killed in the West Bank in two separate incidents and just a few weeks apart, both 17 years old, both uh, American citizens. And um, in one case, evidence suggests that Israeli settlers 
uh, where the murderers uh, killed Kador. Um, and witnesses said that Jabbar, the other boy, was was shot by two Israelis, one a civilian, and the other was either a soldier or a police officer. There's a video um, showing when Kador was killed. They were dri- and both of them were driving. Again, just very similar incidents. Um, there's one video where he's driving with his friends, and they, they hear gunshots, and they're like, oh, is the army around here? And then it, it kind of cuts out, and he gets shot in the head. Um, and then back in 2022, Israeli forces killed Shireen Abu Ekla, who's a Palestinian-American journalist for Al Jazeera. She was shot in the neck while wearing a bulletproof vest and a helmet that said press. So she was shot right in between those you know, two protective things, the helmet and the vest. And again, she had the vest with the big letters that said press. She was covering, she was working, um, and she was killed by an Israeli soldier. Um, so this is something that happens and you never see any sort of, you know, uh, accountability for these uh, killings of, of Americans. And you see the outrage over the American citizen who was killed in Gaza recently. Um, but this seems to have already essentially is a, almost out of the news cycle already just a few days after it happened. All right, so the next one here, Israel pulls out of Janine but denies end of West Bank offensive. This article is from Middle East Eye. Israeli forces have pulled out of Janine after a 10-day assault, but the military has denied it's ending its operation in the occupied West Bank. And so this was on Friday. This story is from Friday. The offensive, which has so far left at least 39 Palestinians dead, saw soldiers backed by armored vehicles and bulldozers targeting the city and its adjacent refugee camp, forcing the flight of many of the residents. Tensions in the West Bank were raised even further on Friday when a U.S. citizen was shot and killed, which I just... When over, Palestinians started returning to their Janine homes on Friday, while those who had been trapped by the offensive were able to venture outside for the first time in more than a week. One resident of the refugee camp said the Israelis left early in the morning. Um, So this is someone who was there, said that they did not uh, leave their house for 10 days. They were left without electricity and water for a lot of those days. Um... And they're saying many houses are destroyed. Other houses were used as military bases, and they destroyed the roads and lots of the infrastructure. So a lot of rebuilding that needs to be done, and that's something Israel uh, impedes all the time is the uh, you know construction, any sort of construction in the occupied territories. Um, so the raids continue in other parts of the northern West Bank. It looks like um, so. Uh, not really clear if this big assault is over yet, but it seems like the big attack on Janine is at least over for now. All right, so the next one here, three Israeli security guards shot dead by Jordanian truck drivers. So this article is from The Cradle. Three Israeli security guards were shot and killed at the Allenby Bridge border crossing between Jordan and the occupied West Bank. And this was on Sunday, and the man who carried out the shooting, reportedly a truck driver from Jordan, arrived at the terminal and opened fire at the security guards from close range, shooting them in the head before he was himself shot and killed by border security guards. Um, So they were all around 50 years old, these guards that were killed. Israel Haim reported that a preliminary investigation into the circumstances of the attack indicates that a truck driver who arrived from the Jordanian side, had concealed a Kalashnikov rifle in his vehicle. He drew the weapon and opened fire on Israeli workers after reaching the shared unloading area, but before a security check was conducted. Um, so, you know, this is uh, from, again, on the Jordan side of the West Bank Jordan crossing. And, you know, Jordan is about, I believe, about 50% of the population are Palestinian refugees. And, you know, there is a lot of anti-Israel sentiment, of course, in the country and a lot of anger over their government's cooperation with the U.S. and Israel. So, um, of course, the government is denouncing this. um, But this is something, you know, that could build, you know, there could be more of this. This seems to be, you know, kind of a lone gunman who just did this this on his own but there's always a possibility of things um this anger uh among the jordanian population kind of boiling over all right so i want to mention our sponsor for today's show and that is the expat money summit so if you go to expatmoneysummit.com you can get your free ticket to this um online event 
And this is put on by Mikkel Thorup, uh, the host of the Expat Money Show and a highly sought after expat consultant with over two decades of experience. It's being held from October 7th to the 11th. And at this summit, you can discover why international diversification is a must if you want to preserve your liberty and your wealth. Learn everything that you need to know about crafting a plan B. That means getting a passport for another country, a place where you could go, you know, if things go down or whatever, for whatever reason you want to leave the country that you live in now. I know my wife's Australian and my kids can get citizenship. So if we ever needed to, for whatever reason, we could go to Australia, which is kind of a nice backup plan to have. Uh, learn everything uh, about um, diversifying your finances offshore, investing in international real estate, and get in-depth insights on geopolitics from world-renowned experts. Headli headline speakers include Dr. Ron Paul, Doug Casey, Scott Horton, Tom Woods, Mark Faber, Tom Luongo, many more. So to get your free ticket, go to expatmoneysummit.com. That's E X P A T. Uh, and if you want a VIP ticket, you can get $100 off by clicking the link in the description. And with that ticket, you'll get access to these panels, and I'll be on one of them discussing the risk of World War III. So expatmoneysummit.com or click the link in the description to get your VIP ticket. All right, so back to the news here. The CIA and the MI6 praise Ukraine's invasion of Kursk. So... This story is really something here. We had uh, CIA Director William Burns and Richard Moore, the head of the UK's MI6 Foreign Intelligence Agency, spoke at an unprecedented joint public event in London on Saturday where they praised Ukraine's invasion of Russia's Kursk Oblast. Moore said that the Kursk invasion was, quote, typically audacious and bold on the part of the Ukrainians, to try and change the game. It had brought the war home to ordinary Russians, end quote. So I made that, that's the headline. The full headline is that the CIA, MI6, praise Ukraine's Kursk invasion for bringing the war to ordinary Russians. So basically saying that they brought the war to the civilian population. And um, Burns said the operation in Kursk was a significant tactical achievement that boosted morale in Ukraine. And, uh, you know, he calls it a tactical achievement. It seems like Ukraine, one idea here was to get Russia to divert its military resources to this area instead of, you know, moving it away from the Eastern Front. Uh, but Russia didn't do that. The fighting continues in Kursk. They haven't driven the Ukrainians out. But... Russia has is continuing to move along, uh, and they're they're moving along at a more rapid pace now in the east in the Donbass. So the U.S. and its allies claim that they were not involved in the planning of the Kursk invasion, but a Ukrainian soldier said that Western intelligence was crucial for the attack. Ukrainian forces have been using U.S. and British weapons in the assault, which of course marked a big escalation of the proxy war. So at this event, which was hosted by Financial Times, Burns downplayed concerns about potential Russian escalations in response to the Western support for Ukraine. He said, quote, I think there was a moment in the fall of 2022 when there was a genuine risk of the potential use of tactical nuclear weapons. I have never thought, however, and this is my view of my agency, this is the view of my agency, that we should be unnecessarily intimidated by that. Putin's a bully and he's going to continue to saber rattle from time to time, end quote. So he's saying that there was a real risk in the fall of 2022 of a nuclear weapon being used and the u.s just escalated things since then so i mean it just goes to show how um reckless this whole thing is um they're really poking and pushing russia and they actually thought it was possible that they might use a nuke so that's the attitude i guess is that they're not worried about that uh the event so this event marked the first time that the heads of the cia and mi6 had appeared in public together both spy agencies have been deeply involved with Ukraine's intelligence agencies following the 2014 coup that ousted Yanukovych. I linked to the New York Times article there about um, the CIA building up these spy bases in Ukraine and, and helping build up the intelligence agencies following 2014. And the MI6 is mentioned in there quite a bit, too. They're very involved, and they've been very involved in planning, helping Ukraine plan sabotage attacks and things like that. So just very provocative to see the two intelligence agencies 
saying these things, saying this is great. They're bringing the war to the Russians, to the ordinary Russians, um, you know, real happy about it. All right, so the next one here. So this is some goodish news here. Uh, Austin says that long-range strikes in Russia would not be a game changer. So on Friday, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin pushed back on Ukraine's requests to use U.S. and other NATO-provided weapons to launch long-range strikes inside Russian territory. So at a meeting of Ukraine's backers at the Ramstein Air Base in Germany, Austin was asked if the U.S. would allow long-range strikes and said that no one capability would be a game changer for ukraine he said quote i don't believe that one specific capability is going to be decisive our approach is to integrate things and to make sure that they have the right skill sets to employ those capabilities and those capabilities are linked to specific objectives end quote austin said that russia has moved back some of its military assets so they're out of range of ukraine's Attackums, which are the U.S. provided missiles that have a range of about 190 miles. Austin noted that Ukraine has drones that can hit targets further inside Russia than the attack the attackums and the British provided storm shadow missiles. They have a range of about 155 miles. Austin said, "Quote: I think Ukraine has a pretty significant capability of its own to address targets that are well beyond the range of attackums or even storm shadow, for that matter." There are a lot of targets in Russia, a big country, obviously, and there's a lot of capability that Ukraine has in terms of UAVs and other things to address those targets, end quote. So I think it's good to see Austin saying these things because it sounds like he's saying that they're not going to sign off on these long range strikes, which would have been the next escalation, which is one of the things Russia's really warning against. They're saying they're going to change their nuclear doctrine. So again, this is very serious stuff. There's already the big escalation with the Kursk invasion, but it looks like they're not. You know, there are, there are, have been other signs that they might that they are ready to do this. But I, I I hope that Austin's thinking is the prevailing thinking in the administration. But that might not be the case. Um, so during this meeting, uh, which is called this is the Ukraine Defense Contact Group, they call it. Zelensky made another pitch for permission to carry out long range strikes. That's what he was saying um, to all the different countries that attended. He says we need to make Russian cities and even soldiers think about what they need, um, peace or Putin, as he put it. So uh, we'll see how things play out with everything. But this, again, is a sign that the U.S. is not ready to sign off on these long-range strikes. All right, so the next one here, the U.S. announces $250 million for Ukraine, $250 million arms package. So the U.S. on Friday announced a $250 million weapons package for Ukraine that includes HIMARS ammunition, air defenses, Stinger missiles, artillery rounds, and other equipment. The weapons package is being provided through the Presidential Drawdown Authority, which allows President Biden to provide arms directly from U.S. military stockpiles. The funds are being pulled from the $95 billion foreign military aid bill that President Biden signed into law back in April, and that included $61 billion to fund the proxy war in Ukraine. So a lot of times when we talk about these arms packages, people think it's like new spending, and they are actually spending the money, but it comes from the funds that have been authorized already. So it's still coming from that $61 billion. Um, So according to the Pentagon, this arms package includes RIM-7 missiles in support for air defense, Stinger missiles, HIMARS ammunition, 155mm and 105mm artillery rounds, uh, tow missiles, Javelin, AT-4, anti-armor systems, Bradley fighting vehicles, armored personnel carriers, the MRAP vehicles, small arms, patrol boats, maritime training equipment, demolitions, and spare parts and everything. So the Pentagon also released a fact sheet stating that the U.S. has committed $59.9 billion in military equipment to Ukraine since the Russian invasion began in February 2022. Once the $61 billion, so total spending, including the other kinds of aid and assistance and uh, money for new U.S. military deployments, uh, is about $186 billion, and that includes the $61 billion that they're still spending. So, but when once that's done, the total that the US has spent on this thing, at least that we're aware of, would will be one hundred and eighty-six billion dollars. Almost, I mean, man, they're really racking it up. 
All right, so the next one here, uh, Israel kills 94 Palestinians in Gaza in three days. So Israeli forces have killed at least 94 Palestinians in the Gaza Strip over the past three days, according to numbers released by Gaza's health ministry. The ministry said on Saturday that 61 Palestinians were killed and another 162 were injured over the previous 48-hour period. So that was on Saturday that they said that. They gave an update for the previous 48 hours. And then on Sunday, the ministry said that another 33 Palestinians were killed in those previous 24 hours. So that's 94 over the past three days. And uh, that brings the total to 40,972. So getting close to 41,000 and the number of wounded to 94,761. And if you see this picture, I mean, this is just a heartbreaking picture. It's a little girl missing both of her legs in a hospital bed. Her face looks like it was badly burned. Um, and uh, we don't have much information about her, but the ca the caption of this image that I got from Reuters um, says, uh, you see a woman is standing next to her. Um, it says an aunt tries to comfort Palestinian child Hanan at the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Hospital in Deir al-Bala on September 8th. A few days ago, Hanan's family was reportedly bombed in an Israeli strike, during which both of her parents were killed. According to relatives, Hanan lost both of her legs, and her sister, Misk, who was also at the hospital, lost her right foot. So, you know, we talk about the death, the number of dead, but also the, that number of wounded includes a lot of people who are maimed, a lot of children who are maimed. There's been a, a lot of amputations and things like that. Um, so some of the strikes that happened over the weekend, uh, on Saturday, two schools turned shelters for displaced people were targeted, one in Gaza City and one in the Jabalia refugee camp. Um, on Sunday, six Palestinians were reported killed in attacks on homes in Gaza City. Details are pretty, again, this stuff just isn't getting as much attention as it, as it was a few months ago. Um, then on September 5th, so this was this past Thursday, Gaza's media office released figures on the number of women and children who have been killed. They said that the Israeli campaign has killed 16,715 children and 11,308 women. Um, and then, of course, the numbers that we get from the health ministry are considered a low estimate. They don't include the Palestinians who are missing and presumed dead under the rubble, which they say is 10,000. They've been saying it's 10,000 for a while, so who knows if that number is really accurate at this point. And then it's also unclear how many people have died due to indirect causes. We have that estimate from those experts writing in The Lancet that the indirect deaths could reach 186,000, and that was an estimate using numbers from June. So that number would be higher. Basically what they did is they took the deaths and multiplied it by, you know, a certain number, um, uh, taking averages from indirect deaths caused in other conflicts and, and they went on the lower end. So it was a conservative estimate using that formula. Um, and, and when they talk about indirect deaths, they mean deaths that have happened and deaths that are going to happen for years to come as a result of the destruction of this infrastructure and the disease and things that people are getting. All right, so the next one here, satellite images show that Israel is paving new roads along the Philadelphia corridor. So this one is from Middle East Eye. Israeli forces are paving a new road running the length of Gaza's border with Egypt, known as the Philadelphia Corridor. Satellite images have shown, according to a BBC report, the imagery, photographs, and video, which were captured between August 26th and September 5th and analyzed by BBC Verify, show fresh tarmac along a section of road extending 6.4 kilometers inland from the coast along the border fence. The construction of the road in the buffer zone, which has become a focal point in ceasefire negotiations, suggests that Israeli forces have no intention of leaving. On Wednesday, video footage circulated online showing construction vehicles laying fresh tarmac along the corridor. Um, so this is, again, the big thing that's been uh, impeding the hostage deal. And Netanyahu saying they're not going to leave. And the construction, you know, they're doing this elsewhere in Gaza, again, just shows that they don't have any plans to leave. And even if they do, they would probably go right back in there. <clears throat> All right, so the next one here, Israeli airstrike kills three paramedics in Lebanon. So on Saturday, Israel carried out an airstrike against a civil defense fire truck in the southern Lebanese town of Frun. The attack killed three paramedics and wounded two others. 
members of the truck, two other members of the truck crew. The crew was in the process of putting out fires in the area from previous Israeli attacks. The attack was reportedly the second time in 12 hours that Israeli forces had attacked an ambulance crew, and we've seen this happen multiple times. Um, the Amal movement, a Shiite political party in Lebanon, said that two of the slain were members of their organization. Uh, so the IDF issued a statement on the attack insisting that they eliminated terrorists from the Amal movement, but it looks like they just killed paramedics. And uh, there's no indication that the slain were anything but paramedics. So this article is written by Jason Ditz, by the way. I don't think I said that. Uh, the next one here, Israeli strikes central Syria, killing at least five. This is another article from Jason. So Israeli war, plane, war planes were reported to have carried out at least 15 airstrikes against central Syria with the deadliest attack centered around the city of Masyaf, which is west of Hama. Syrian state media is reporting that at least five people were killed and 19 wounded. State media in Syria also reported that the air defenses were activated against the strikes in the Hama province and that firefighting forces are active trying to extinguish the fires caused by the attacks. It's not clear what is being targeted by the Israelis here. There's been no official Israeli statement. They usually don't put out statements on their strikes in Syria. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, which often functions as a mouthpiece for the opposition in Syria, said that one of the strikes had targeted a scientific research center in Mas Yaf. Um, so we don't really know what they were targeting, but this seems to be pretty significant airstrikes. All right, so the next one here, U.S.-Iraq deal would withdraw hundreds of troops. So Reuters reported on Friday that the U.S. and Iraq have reached an understanding on a withdrawal plan that would see the U.S. remove hundreds of troops from Iraq by September 2025. Under the plan, the U.S. would complete the withdrawal by September 2026, but the report said the U.S. could leave a small number of troops in Iraq under a new advisory relationship. The 2,500 troops that are currently in Iraq are deployed under the U.S.-led anti-ISIS coalition. Sources told Reuters that the plan is completed but still needs final approval from both capitals and an announcement date. So under this plan, the U.S. would remove hundreds of troops from the Ain al-Assad Air Base in western Iraq and, and then reduce its presence in Baghdad by September 2025. Over the following year, the U.S. would remove troops from Erbil in Iraqi Kurdistan. So the U.S. and Iraq began talks on the future of the U.S. military presence after Iraqi Prime Minister Mohammed Shia al-Sudani called for an end to the U.S.-led coalition following an escalation between the U.S. and the PMF, the Popular Mobilization Forces, which is the group of Shia militias that are part of the Iraqi security forces. So I'm a little, uh, I don't know, um, you know, this sounds like good news, like they have this withdrawal plan, but I've been following this pretty closely and judging by what everybody's been saying you know, the U.S. is trying to do everything they can not to leave. I mean, the fact that this is a two-year plan to withdraw 2,500 troops, I mean, that should not take long at all. Um, goes to show that I think they're going to be up to some, you know, try to figure out how to stay. And also last month, as I covered, the State Department said that these talks have not involved discussions about a U.S. withdrawal. They said that flat out. Um so that signals that the U.S. plans to stay. They're saying that basically they're going to change the mission. You know, they're going to end the U.S.-led anti-ISIS coalition and establish a bilateral security relationship. The thing is, is that there are a lot of people in Iraq that want the U.S. to leave. So the Iraqi government is under a lot of pressure to get that done. So something, you know, this uh, would probably placate might they might do this to try to placate some people say yeah we'll, we'll withdraw some troops but we'll figure out a way to stay in the meantime but i think the clock is ticking for the u.s because it's really not welcome in iraq so hopefully this does lead to a full u.s withdrawal i don't want to be too pessimistic here um but uh you know, one reason why the u.s is able to stay they can basically destroy the iraqi economy they control their foreign reserves they can destroy their uh, currency, destroy their economy. So they're basically holding the country hostage. And they, this Reuters report actually quotes U.S. officials who say, yeah, well, you know, we're in Iraq because of ISIS, but also because we want to push back against Iran. You know, so it's very clear that they don't want to leave Iraq. 
And the Iraqi presence supports the occupation of Syria. They don't want to give that up either. But we'll see. Again, hopefully let's uh, this leads to a U.S. withdrawal because all this presence does is just a tripwire for a big war, puts U.S. troops in danger. They got to come home. So hopefully that's what ends up happening here. All right, so the next one, uh, the Houthis claim that they downed another U.S. MQ-9 Reaper drone. This one is from Al Jazeera. So the Houthis have claimed to have shot down a United States military drone over Yemen in the latest attack by the group, which has disrupted shipping trade through the crucial Bab El Mandab Strait. Um, the Yemeni group has carried out dozens of attacks on ships with links to Israel in a show of solidarity with Palestinians amid Israel's 11-month-old war on Gaza. So Yahya Sari. The military spokesman of the Houthis said in a pre-recorded video message released early on Sunday that the MQ-9 Reaper drone was shot down by air defenses over Marib as it was carrying out hostile activities. So if if this is true, <laughs> this is the eighth U.S. MQ-9 Reaper drone that the Houthis have downed. If all of their claims have been true, the U.S. has, has confirmed some of these drones went down. Others, you know, they, they wouldn't confirm, but they also didn't deny. So, I mean, this is a lot of these MQ-9 drones. They're, they're worth about $30 million. Um, and the Houthis usually put out footage. In this case, apparently, they haven't so far. But, I mean, that's pretty embarrassing for the U.S. to lose this many drones. And these aren't just little drones. I mean, these are, you know, they carry Hellfire missiles and everything. Um, it se- seems like they're, these ones that the Houthis have been shooting down are being used for surveillance over Yemen, and the U.S. has been launching strikes. So, uh, you know, of course, they're going to try to down these things if they see them. All right, so that is it for the news for today. That was a lot of stuff. Uh, Go check out our viewpoints, one from Ramsey Baroud, Ben Gavir and the acceleration of the collapse of Israel, one from James Carden, foreign policy establishment licks its chops for Harris, Uh, one from Genevieve Landers, University of California rolls out free speech policies to curtail Gaza protests, one from Thomas Brody, disinformation dilemma, U.S. hands are way are way dirty, too. And our spotlight from Haaretz, Israel is turning the West Bank into Gaza. So please go check all of that stuff out. Um, That's it for me for today. I hope everybody had a good weekend. You can always support this show by sharing it. Tell your friends about Antiwar.com. Like, subscribe, and comment. All that stuff helps out. I will be back tomorrow with some more news. Thanks for listening.